Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and welcome to my Games of the Month video log for July 2024. In this video, I'll be talking about all of the games that I've played in July, as well as giving you a channel update and telling you what's coming up in the future. First of all, a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters for funding the channel. And I know I say this every month, but this month has been one of some ups and downs. And I really appreciate the support that I get from my Patreon supporters, not just financially, but obviously the community support is great. If you like the content that I create and you want to support me directly, this video, for example, is not sponsored in any way. It takes me about a day to create these videos and I don't make any money from them. All of the advertising revenue goes to charity. This is one of many videos that's only possible through the support of the Patreon campaign. So yeah, a huge thank you to all of my supporters for making these videos possible. And if you want to support me, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. So let's crack on with the games. Now, the first week of July, I took the week off work. Now, for those of you that don't know, my work is creating videos for board games. So what did I do? on my week off work because it was my birthday on the 3rd of July and I decided to celebrate by taking the week off work and creating board game videos. But the difference was I wasn't being paid for any of them. So what I did at the start of July was something which I've been wanting to do for a while and this is to help me in counteract some of the negative feelings that I have from great games that I want to play that I don't have time to play. And I've got a number of games which I've been wanting to cover on the channel for, you know, either a month, either six months, or in some cases, many years. And they just never seem to have time to do it. And I thought the only way that I am going to be able to tackle this issue is to take the week off work. And then in that week, pick 10 games and say, right, these are the games that I'm never going to be able to play normally because I don't have time. And I'm going to go and do it. It was great. Apart from the fact that I was suffering from quite severe insomnia for the first couple of weeks in July. So I was doing these daily streams in a boiling hot studio on virtually no sleep whatsoever. But other than that, the games that I played, very, very happy with. And again, this is all thanks to the support of the Patreon campaign. If it weren't for that, I, I simply wouldn't be able to take a week off work. But it was great. And I want to do the same thing again, maybe even twice a year. Definitely once a year, but definitely maybe twice a year. And the reason is... The positive feelings that I got from actually getting around to playing some of these games was, was fantastic. And I don't know how many of you, let me know if you're in the same position as I am, in that you've got all these games and you know they're great games and you just don't have time to play them and it's giving you negative feelings. I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels this way and the only advice I've got is that it is within your power to do something about it. Whether you stop one of your regular gaming nights or decide to take a weekend away or something like that and you've just got to make it happen and that's what I had to do. So let's talk about the games that I've played that week. First of all, on the Monday, Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. I've spoken about this game many times in the past. I've actually done a whole solo playthrough series of the first campaign, which is about eight or nine episodes. We decided that we were going to start the Curse of the Crimson Throne campaign, which is the second campaign that was available for what's called the core set, which is effectively the second edition of the game. I didn't really get on that well with the first edition of the game, but the core set, it turned into one of my favourite games. I love the game. It's quite random with all of the card draw and with all of the dice rolls, but there's something about it that I really like. And I've been wanting to play Curse of the Crimson Throne campaign for a very long time, and we played three games of it that day. All of those videos are on the channel if you are interested in watching them. Go back to the 1st of July. It was three separate videos for the first three games of the campaign. I'm really happy that I got to play it again. I really enjoyed the game. It was possibly my most enjoyable game that I played that week. But that was the first three games of a 24-game campaign. And straight afterwards, we all said, we want to do more of this. We want to play more of this campaign. And yeah... So thankfully, the negative feelings from not covering it has gone, but I want to play that game more. 24 games in that campaign. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to get time to do it. Now, we do play with, uh, it's not really a house rule, but essentially the Pathfinder Adventure Card game, like many games, is a campaign driven game where if you do not succeed in a scenario, you play that scenario again. No, absolutely no. I'm not going to do that. What I do with that and other games in that genre is that I play the game and we always try our hardest to win. It's not that we don't try our hardest. We do, 
But whether we win or we lose, we move on to the next one. If you really want to, you can say one point for a win and you try and get as many points as you can in the campaign, maximum of 24. And I've had this discussion with somebody and I'm curious to see what you think about it. Because the last time I talked about the fact that we move on, whether we win a scenario or not, their counterpoint to that was, well, there's no jeopardy. You will be less invested in trying to succeed if there isn't any penalty clause or anything like that. Absolutely not whatsoever. Me and the other players, we try our best. We really do to try and win the scenario. So it doesn't affect us. Anyway, let me know what you think. That is Pathfinder Adventure Card Game on the Monday. Then on the Tuesday, an old friend of mine, Ian Haywood, came over. Another game that I've been wanting to cover on the channel for probably about five or six years now is Battle Law 2nd Edition. Battle Law 2nd Edition is the Fantasy Flight Games fantasy version of the Memoir 44 system, which is actually the Command and Colours system, designed by Richard Borg. And it is a tactical war game, but I much prefer the battle law system because it isn't just about killing your opponents. In fact, you don't get any points in the game for killing your opponents. It's all about achieving the objectives. Anyway, a number of years ago, I painted all of the miniatures for this game. I'll, if I can find some photos, I'll put them on screen now. And I finished painting all of the miniatures from the core set of this. And I thought, right, now that I've painted all the miniatures, I need to play this game. And me and Ian actually did get a game of this in probably about four years ago at either GridCon 1 or GridCon 2, I can't quite remember. But the plan was at some point Ian would come over and we'd play the game. And we did. And I really enjoyed it. So that video is on the channel now. We did make a couple of rules mistakes, so check the description of that video. Obviously none of the videos that week were sponsored because I wasn't being paid anything for them. But it was really good to play the game. Want to play it again? Yes, I definitely want to play Battle Lore again. I really enjoy the system. And I think from the ones that I've experienced, it is, as I said, my favourite one of those games in that series. Next up, on the same day, another game that I've been wanting to cover on the channel for a long time, and this is Championship Formula Racing. And my first question for those people who are watching this is, have you heard of this game? Because I'll be honest, this is not a well-known game. It's based on a very old Avalon Hill game called Speed Circuit. And this version of the game, Championship Formula Racing, was published by Ultra Pro. Yes, the, public, the, the company that makes sleeves, they've also published a couple of games. So this one went under the radar. I managed to get a copy of this at Gen Con probably about five or six years ago. I've been searching for the perfect Formula One game for many, many, many years. And this is a game which I got. I played it a couple of times and I really enjoyed it. And I thought at some point I want to cover this game on the channel. Now, in the last year or so, we've had heat from Days of Wonder. Heat has been, it's taken the world by storm. It has been well received. It has been a fantastic game. And a lot of people say it, it's the best racing game. And heat is very good. I do very much enjoy heat. I think I might prefer championship formula racing. The downside of this game is because it is quite an unknown game with not much i mean there is a fan base for the game but there were rules issues and this this was a problem that we had during the playthrough and i've since been in communication with the designer and the fan base on the discord channel and there's still some rules that i don't know the game is definitely in need of a rule book overhaul and if i do get any time then as a you know, as a, as a freebie, I will rewrite the rules for that game because I think it is a very good game and it needs a bit more support. There's rumours about a possible new edition coming out later on, but let me know if you have played Championship Formula Racing or indeed if you've played the old Avalon Hill game Speed Circuit. If you want to see a playthrough of the game, bear in mind we did get stuck with some of the rules, then check out that on the channel. That is on there now. That same day, we also played Primal The Awakening. So after the game of Championship Formula Racing, we went downstairs and we played a game of Primal The Awakening. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later on. I have spoken about it on previous video logs, but I'll mention it again later on. Right, on the Wednesday, this was the big day. This was my actual birthday itself. And I decided for my birthday, instead of playing Mage Knight, which is my favourite game of all time, I was going to play an entire campaign of Hoplomarchus Victorum. Now, Hoplomarchus Victorum is, I believe, a 2023 game, officially, on BGG, but I got a copy of it at Essen 2022. And I remember playing it. I've done a few videos of me playing Hoplomarchus Victorum 
a couple of them in fact one of them was definitely public and has been on the channel and one of them i think was private and i think i did another one where i played half of act one teaching a friend of mine how to play but this is a game which is a solo game only and it takes place over four acts and it is this big epic campaign it's a totally replayable campaign each individual act sees you progressing your character uh, increasing their stats fighting bigger monsters and basically traveling across the land in the hope to defeat the scion at the end on mount vesuvius and after playing that first few games of it i was like this is amazing this i love this game this is so good and at some point i am going to need to play the full campaign and again the negative feelings built up because the whole of 2023 went by and it didn't happen and I'm like, well, I've got to make this happen. So I decided on my birthday, I am going to do one big long live stream from 10 o'clock in the morning until I finish. I will pause for food breaks and things like that. But one big long live stream and I play the entire campaign. This was the day where I was struggling more than any other. I'd had about two hours sleep the night before because I had insomnia issues. I had a migraine. And I was in a baking hot room and I was live streaming this game all day long. It was a real struggle. Now, it was fantastic. The game is brilliant and I love the game, but I underestimated the amount of time it would take. And by about seven o'clock at night, I think it was, six o'clock, seven o'clock at night, we were two acts in. And I thought it was three acts and then a final boss. It's not, it's actually four acts and then the final boss. So, yes, I underestimated the time that it was going to take. Which meant, on the Thursday morning, I then carried on playing. I thought, right, I'm going to finish this. So I got up early on the Thursday morning. I'd actually booked off the Thursday morning as a little bit of a little bit of a break, because I knew I would be tired. No break for me. I got on and carried on playing Hoplomarchus. But we didn't finish it. We got to the end of Act 3. So on the Sunday, I completed it. So if you're interested in watching Paul's Hoplomarchus Victorum, there are three videos... One on the Wednesday, which is Act 1 and 2. One on the Thursday morning, which was Act 3. And then the final act was Act 4, which was done on the Sunday. Now, a big thank you to Chip Theory Games. Not only did they give me the review copy of the game back in 2022, but they supported those playthroughs by offering a giveaway. Now, the giveaway has now closed, but I did run a contest. And congratulations to Ryan for not getting all of the questions right, but Ryan has won a copy of Hoplomarchus Victorum. So big thank you to Chip Theory Games for, again, supporting me, supporting the channel and giving a free copy of the game away to Ryan. Ryan's been one of my patron supporters for many years. So let me know, Ryan, how you get on with the game. Next up, on the Thursday, a game that I have been wanting to properly play, no kidding, for about 30 years. So back in the mid 90s, I was shopping in London um, and I went into a shop called Orc Nest, which is still there. It is still a board game shop in London. And I found a copy of a game called Age of Exploration by Tom Lehman. Now, Tom Lehman is now big designer. Tom has done lots and lots of great games. Probably Race for the Galaxy might be his most famous one. But Tom has done a number of fantastic games and he's still designing games now. Well, back in the 90s, he was designing games then. But games then were very different from what they are now. And this is a game which I bought on theme, ma mainly the theme. So I was, in, I was in London, as I say, I was in the shop and I saw this game on the shelf and it was Can You Circumnavigate the Globe? And this is a simulation game. You are basically taking place one of the explorers in the, is it 14th century, 15th century, whenever it was, you leave from Portugal or whatever and you have to load up your boat with supplies, provisions and things like that. You travel across the Atlantic and you are trying to discover America. That's essentially what the game is. But this is very much a game of massive random elements, drawing lots and lots of cards and things like that. But it is historically very accurate. A lot of work has gone into this game and a lot of work has gone into making sure that the mechanisms of the game and the way that it works actually try to mirror what happened so you might set off on your ship and then you might get um you know 
whatever it is that attach themselves to the hull and eat through the hull. Your crew members might start suffering some scurvy, so you've got to stop off at one of the islands and, and replenish with supplies and things like that. All of those things happen in the game. It is not certainly a game, I think, for a modern audience. And it was the game which, I'll be honest with you, I was least looking forward to playing all week. Because I... I, I j this is a game, as I say, it's more of a simulation than a game itself. And I knew it had quite a high random element. And I knew it was just going to be load up your ship. Do we die on the way there? And that kind of thing. Anyway, Pete came over, who's been on the channel a number of times, local friend of mine. Pete played this game a lot decades ago. So I thought, well, brilliant. At least he knows how to play. The rule book for this game is of its time. It's clear in some places, but in other places, it's really not clear. But anyway. I enjoyed this game. I'm not going to play it again, but I actually enjoyed it. I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I was going to do. So if you're interested in just seeing what the game is about, then check it out. My video is on Board Game Geek. It's also on the channel. It's the only video for the last 13 years that has been made of this game. That's how little known this game is. When I went to upload it to Board Game Geek, I was like, wow, the last video on this game was 13 years ago. Anyway, really happy to have played it again. Thank you very much, Pete, for putting in the effort to, to learn in the game. And yeah, that is Age of Exploration. Now, on the Friday, Friday was a very special day. This was the end of the week, and I played a number of games on the Friday. First of all, I got up early in the morning, and I played a game of Gaia Project on Board Game Arena with Def from the Board Game Barbecue podcast and Ian O'Toole. So we had a three-player game of Gaia Project on Board Game Arena with Dev and Ian, and it was great. And again, that's on the channel. If you want to watch it, go and check it out Friday, the 5th of July, Gaia Project. Gaia Project is an amazing game. I only played it once when it came out and then hadn't played it since. I've now played it about eight times this year already, and it is incredible. Gaia Project for me, I think I spoke about this last month as well. Yeah, I'm really enjoying Gaia Project, and I'll talk a bit more about the expansion, because there's an expansion coming for it. I'll talk about that later on. Then in the afternoon, Rick came over, and we played Forbidden Stars. Now, Forbidden Stars broke the mould on the games that I played that, that week, because all of these games that I've spoken about, well, maybe not Gaia Project. No, Gaia Project was special. We played it on Friday morning, because I had the opportunity to do it. And I think it was Def's 100th game of Gaia Project. So I said, well, look, if you want to join me on a live stream, we can do that. But all of the other games that I've talked about are games which I've been really wanting to cover on the channel. Forbidden Stars, I've only recently got hold of a copy. But me and Rick wanted to play it. I wanted, I played it once many, many, many years ago with a friend of mine, Adam, who'd borrowed a copy of a friend of his. And I remember loving the game. Really remember loving the game. And I was lucky enough to manage to get hold of a copy. Thank you very much, Martin, for, for that copy. And we played it, and it is as good as I remember. And I desperately want to play this game again with three or four players. It's on the channel. If you're interested, this is a Warhammer 40k themed game that is published by Fantasy Flight Games, which is no longer available. Copies are going for crazy money because it is very, very good. And yeah, it was just a really good game. So that was Forbidden Stars. And then in the evening, we played Space Crusade. Now, Space Crusade is a game which I grew up playing. When it came out, okay, I wasn't a kid when it came out, but I was still young and I was still playing lots of games. And when Space Crusade first came out, I remember playing it lots. In fact, I have a memory from sometime in the late 80s going to a Star Trek convention in Birmingham and taking Space Crusade with me and was playing it in the hotel lobby till about three o'clock in the morning. If you're watching this video and you're one of the people that was with me that day, then hello. It was good at the time. But the reason we played it is Rick has been banging on for years about covering Space Crusade on the channel. And I thought, well, I'll tell you what, it's the end of the week. Let's do something fun. Let's play Space Crusade. Mark Monk came over from Ninja Geek Games, joined us, and we played a three-player game of Space Crusade. I was happy that we played it because it was fun, but I'm glad it was over in about, was it an hour and a quarter or an hour and a half? It's a terrible game. Absolutely terrible. 
the design of the game is amazing how much things have come on and I had flashbacks to when I covered Hero Quest during lockdown and I was like oh but it wasn't as bad as that but we were like okay I mean to give you an idea it is a, a one versus many game where one of the players plays the bad guys and they have take you know they're, they're, they're putting you enemies on board and they're trying to shoot you and everything else and the other players each take like a, a squadron of space marines now you could play it two player just with one person as the bad guy and one person as five space marines or you could play a four player game with three players each playing five space marines does the game scale no not at all now i'm going off information which i think is correct if i'm wrong Please let me know, and I will take back these words. But we were like, so there's no scaling in this game whatsoever? So in other words, if you're playing just one-on-one, -on -one, you are literally fighting against absolutely everything with one squad. Whereas if you're... Oh, it's just uh, bonkers. And that, I mean, yes, the game has dice for combat. It has movement on the board. At least it doesn't have dice for movement, which Hero Quest did. But it is very random, and it does have lots and lots of dice rolling. The biggest problem was the big thing at the end that you needed to kill had lots of armour. So unless you rolled massively high on the dice, you weren't going to get through it. So, you know, it's it's got that in it. But the other thing with it is that the big boss at the end, which was worth so many points that whoever killed it was going to win the game, the rest of the stuff made no difference whatsoever, is it had three hit points and I managed to do two damage to it and then Mark came along and shot it and dealt one damage and got 50 points. And it's like, oh, there you go. So it's the game is of its time and I remember playing the game and having fun. I don't want to play it again. I'm, I, I just, I do not want to play it again. Now, somebody was telling me that they've improved on this system and it's been tweaked and changed and there are later games, a little bit like Blackstone Fortress, is is the culmination of where the hero quest system has developed over the years and i think blackstone fortress is the 40k version of warhammer silver tower is that right which is a much more improved version of it anyway i don't know that was the end of the week we did it it was a bit of fun also on that day we played primal twice me and rick played it in the afternoon and then that was a two-play game and then mark played it in the evening so, yeah, that's that's three games of Primal already in July. Again, I'll talk about Primal a little bit later on. Moving on, ISS Vanguard. Our campaign continues. We played it three times in July, on the 9th, the 16th, and the 30th. What can I say that I haven't already said about this game? Well, I'm going to tell you something different. I'm not going to repeat everything that I've said. I've spoken about ISS Vanguard a lot. If you haven't seen my other video logs, I will give you a very brief summary. It is amazing. We are absolutely loving it. It is either my first or second favourite narrative-driven campaign game of all time, with the other one being Tainted Grail. I think Tainted Grail might just tip it, but it's fantastic, and I absolutely love the game. Now, I want to talk about an experience that we had with our most recent game of it, which I've been going through in my mind, and it was actually the session itself was a little bit of a... It was my least favourite session. We've played it 14 or 15 times and it wasn't a great session. Now, we've, I've since analysed that and this is not a problem with the game. Basically, without giving too many spoilers away, we went on a mission that should have been obvious that this is a really important mission and we, we took low-ranked characters with us. Now, the reason why we took low-ranked characters with us is we don't have many characters of rank two or rank three we've got lots of rank one and the best way or what we thought might have been the only way to rank up these is to send them on missions get success tokens and rank them up so we've been sending rank one crew members onto missions in the hope to rank them up so we get to rank two and rank three and things like that but we should have known we should have known that this was a very dangerous very important mission and we shouldn't have sent rank one crew members that was the first thing the second thing is and we all died in the mission but that's not a problem. This is not a campaign game where you can get attached to your characters. Yeah, we we died. All three characters died in this mission and we lost some stuff and the lander got destroyed and everything else. But And, and that will give you the, oh, that sucked. 
But you've got to think of the big picture of this campaign. The ship is full of crew members. We have plenty of other crew members. There's a whole big universe out there to explore. That was just a minor setback in what is a big epic story. So yes, not the problem that I thought it was at the time, but you're always going to have any game like that where your characters die. If you've got any kind of association with those characters, it, I don't know, let me know what you think. Have you played a campaign game like this where you're not a specific character and those characters can die? I don't think there's many games like that. I mean, games like Gloomhaven come out, your characters can't actually die unless you play with the permadeath. But yeah, let me know what you think. Moving on to the 11th and the 12th, we played Lutia or Luthia or Lutia however you want to pronounce it. This is a new game which is on Kickstarter and I think it's actually at the time of me recording this video. The campaign is actually running right now. This is the second game from Paverson Games. They previously did Distilled and I've got a professional relationship with them. So this was a sponsored playthrough video. I got the game, I learned how to play the game. I did a practice game at the local club on the Thursday night. Then I did another practice game, I think on the Friday afternoon followed by the public playthrough on the Friday night. So if you're interested in that, it is a tutorial and playthrough video of Lutia, which is on the channel now from Friday the 12th of July. Because it was a sponsored video, take what I say with a grain of salt if you want to, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I enjoyed the game. It is a medium to heavy game. I would class it as medium to heavy. Some people might put it slightly more towards the heavier end. I feel that the theme actually does come across a little bit in all of these Euro games. They always have to abstract a number of things, but I did enjoy the game. I think the worker placement mechanism was really good and the different things that you can do in the game is good. There's a good decision space. We all enjoyed the game. People that I played it with on the Thursday night all enjoyed it too. But the, the idea of me creating those playthrough videos is to help you make a decision about whether it's the kind of game that you like. Whether I liked it or not is irrelevant. Go and check out the playthrough if you're interested in that. And help, hope, hopefully that will help make your own decision. Next up, on the 13th, it was a friend's... He's getting married soon. I won't call it a stag party, but it was a games day and there were six of us. And the idea was that we would play six player games. So we started out with the game of Dune Imperium Uprising, which is the latest incarnation of the Dune Imperium game. And there is a six player mode where you play three versus three, with one person on each side being the leader. And it was a great game. I, I was one of the leaders, I think, on the the bad guys side. Yeah, I think I was the bad guys. I think I was the emperor. And it was, it was a good game. Really, really enjoyed it. Now, the way that the six-player game works is that it's a team game with the sort of the, the Fremen, the Atreides, and things like that against the emperor. And it's asymmetric more than the normal game, in that the worms can only be used by the Fremen side and can't be used by the Emperor side. And they are very, very powerful in combat. So we ended up in a situation, I'd never played this game before, but Mark, who hosted the day, and the other people had said, the worms are really powerful, the Fremen side have a massive advantage and they're probably going to win. We got to the end of the game and it actually went down to the wire. It was a tie on points, and they just won on the tiebreaker. So they did win, but it was a lot closer than we thought. I really enjoyed Dune Imperium. That was my first play of Dune Imperium Uprising, and I've played it the, only the team version of the game. So I've not played Dune Imperium Uprising as a normal multiplayer competitive game yet. But yeah, really enjoyed that. Then in the afternoon, we played War of the Ring, the card game, because the latest expansion allows you to play it six player. And I think I spoke about this last month, the War of the Ring, the card game. I'm, I'm not gonna say it's becoming one of my favorite games. I've played it quite a lot over the last six or so weeks, and I'm really, really enjoying this game. And I really wanted the opportunity to play it six player, and the opportunity presented itself, and I thought, right, we're in, let's get in there. It was a cracking game, really, really good game. Really enjoyed it. What was odd, though, is the game was over in round three. Now, this is a game which normally lasts nine rounds. It might last a little bit less. We had an almighty fight at the Inn of the Prancing Pony. I mean, five Nazgul, Gandalf was there, Aragorn was there, everybody was there, and it was this huge fight right in the middle of Bree. 
on round two of the game. It was epic. Um, very, very good. So I, I love War of the Ring, the card game. I think it's a fantastic game. And the latest expansion, Fire and Swords, allows you to play it up to six players, and it works really well. Again, it's three versus three, just like the original four-player game is two versus two. On the same day, we then played Quo Vardis. No, sorry, Zoo Vardis. Zoo Vardis is a re-implementation of an older Reiner Knizia game called Quo Vardis, which I have, which is all about the Roman Senate. Zoo Vardis is a, a re-implementation of the game with some extra optional rules all about animals in a zoo. It's an okay game. It's not one of my favourites, but it's short. And that's the main thing about it. This is a short game and it has negotiation in it. I don't normally like negotiation in games, but in this game it works okay. It's basically, I'd like to borrow your special power for the turn, or I need some votes in order to move me up this track. Would you vote for me? If you do, I'll vote for you here, or I'll give you this token kind of thing. So it, it's that kind of negotiation. I think it's actually a good game, and the fact that you can play it in about 30 minutes or so, yeah. If this was a longer game, absolutely not. But this is another classic, well-designed Reiner Knizia game. So, yeah. Now, none of those games that I've just talked about, Dune Imperium Uprising, War of the Ring, Six Player, or Zuvardis, were streamed because I was at a friend's house. So they are not on the channel. If you go looking for them, you won't find them. Next up is, on the 18th of July, Dan came over, and we played War of the Ring, the card game. But we played the cooperative mode. Now, the cooperative mode and the solo mode are pretty much the same in the game. It's the only mode of the game that I've not played yet. And I really wanted to try it and to see how it went. It didn't go that well because I got quite confused with how the Automa works. Since then, I have gone away, I've reread the rules, I have spoken to some other people, and I now have a much clearer idea of how the Automa works in the game. But, unfortunately, due to... I mean, this wasn't a sponsored video, so I basically took the afternoon off work in order to do it, and I didn't have enough time to prep to learn the solo mode as much as I would have liked. So we pretty much went into it raw, me crossing my fingers, hoping that the rules presented were going to be clear enough that we would have been able to work out how to play for a live stream. And we didn't. Unfortunately, we did get a bit stuck, and thank you very much to the people who were watching live who helped us work through those rules issues. I'm sure we still got a few wrong. But getting rules or, or not fully understanding rules is something that makes me quite uncomfortable. Doing that in the middle of a live stream just makes me even more uncomfortable. So what? why do I do this? Why do I do live streams where I don't know how to play the game before the live stream? It's because I really wanted to do the game and I just simply didn't have time. The amount of time it would have taken to get the game, practice it, probably do a practice live stream, it would have taken an extra four, five, six hours of prep and I just didn't have that amount of time. So I think the Automer is very good. It was just, it's a little bit more complex than I would like personally, but it is very thematic in that it will only do something if that something is going to make a difference. And it, it's exactly what a human player would do. And I think if you ever do try the solo or the cooperative mode of the War of the Ring card game, and you get a bit stuck and bogged down with the rules and you're not quite sure how it plays, then think about what a human player would do. And it's actually quite clever in the way that it will only commit some forces to a particular area if it knows that it's going to be able to win that area in future. So, for example, if it would require, you know, three swords to take a location and it's got a load of cards worth one sword, then it will only put one in if it knows that it can put the others in later in the same round. Otherwise, it's not going to bother, which is exactly what a human player would do. You're not going to commit some forces somewhere and go, uh, am I going to be able to back that up? No. Okay, well, they're dead. They didn't do anything and they're dead. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do that as a human player. So actually, the Automa does follow what a human player would do. The big question, would I play that game again solo or cooperative? Yes and no. No, because the Automa was a little bit outside of my comfort zone, but yes, because... Now that I've been through that, 
and I think I've learned how it goes, I think it would go a lot smoother next time. But my preference would be to always play that game with another human player. So I'm probably not going to play it solo again, but that's just because I prefer it multiplayer. Right, what's next? Manacon. I then left and went to Manacon. Manacon is a UK board game convention that's been running for over 40 years. This was the 40th Manacon, but there was a couple of years where we had COVID, where it didn't run. It's held in Leicester. I'm friends with a lot of the organisers, and I've got very good things to say about Manacon, apart from the fact that it's too hot. The venue, unfortunately, has no air conditioning, and we went through a heat wave in the UK, and I basically spent three and a half days melting. And then the accommodation, no ventilation, no air conditioning, melting. So I mentioned at the start of this video, I've had a number of ups and downs this month. And although being at Manacon was fantastic, I basically had a five day period where I hardly slept. It was just awful physically and mentally. But the games that I played were amazing. So let's talk about the games that I played. First of all, on the Friday, afternoon I played Don't Starve. Now I'm going to talk about this later on. I'd actually learnt how to play it the week before. The designer of the game had taught me how to play on Tabletop Simulator and we had a practice game at Manacon on the Friday afternoon. I'm going to talk about Don't Starve in a bit so we'll come back to that one. Then we played Primal in the evening so again that was another game of Primal. I'd planned to play it at Manacon because my idea was that I need to play it more as it turns out, I have played that game a lot, so I did not need to play it again, but I'm glad I did, because um, I introduced it to some extra people. We did play with four players. Four players is a lot. I think Primal probably works best at two or three. It still works as a game at four. There's just a lot of downtime, a lot more downtime than you would have in a two or three play game. So. I will probably limit my plays of Primal to two or three players in future. Like with a lot of games, I get the same amount back, but in less time. Then, in the evening, after Primal had finished, it was like 10, 10.30. Just had a couple of quick games of So Clover, which is fantastic. Always really good. On the Saturday morning. So, Saturday, I played Civilution in the morning, which I've spoken about before many, many times. Civilution is still fantastic. I still love playing it. It's still really enjoyable every time I play it just because of the huge scope of the things that you can do in the game. And everything you do in the game is just pulling levers, pushing buttons. Oh, I'm going to go over here. What have I found? Oh, I'm going to invent this. It's just great. It's just really enjoyable to play. I'm going to be covering Civilization on the channel later. Black Forest. I got my second game of Black Forest in. I, I learned how to play it at UK Games Expo. This was my first game with the final production copy of the game, which Fuel and Spieler, thank you very much, have sent me an early copy. I am going to be covering Black Forest on the channel at some point. But yeah, Black Forest is effectively a re-implementation of Glass Road, but without the card play mechanism, and it's got replaced that with a board where you move around. It was, it was great. Black Forest may have been my most enjoyable game that I played that weekend. I'm not saying it's a better game than Civilution or Voidfall, which I also played, which I'll talk about in a minute. But looking back on that weekend, Black Forest, the, the game of Black Forest that I played might have been my most enjoyable. It was, it just went smooth, it was fun, it worked, it only took about an hour and three quarters, I think, after the teach, or even an hour and a half, something like that. So yeah, Black Forest, keep an eye on that one. It is going to be released at Essen Spiel this year. And then in the evening, I struggled, because I was barely awake at this point, but we played Gaia Project with the expansion. So this was my first play with the expansion, and thankfully I was playing with other people who were very experienced with the game, so they were able to understand the expansion more than I did. But the expansion, and I'm, I am going to be covering this on the channel as well, and I believe that there's going to be copies available at Gen Con, so there's probably going to be a lot of coverage about the expansion, coming out over the next month or two. I'm I'm due to play it in on the channel in September, as I thought it wasn't going to be released until Essen. But anyway, the expansion is one of those things. Now, I will be absolutely honest with you here. A number of people liked the expansion and said, this is fantastic, this is a no-brainer, I'm definitely getting this. Other people said, there's no need to get this. 
the base game of Gaia Project is so good and so massively replayable, we don't need this extra stuff. And for a number of people, they felt that Gaia Project was already at the level where they're like, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with this, I'm happy with this, don't go beyond this. And if you go beyond this by adding in some extra rules, it's going to put it a little outside of their comfort zone. So make your own decision on the game. It's up to you. If you are a massive Gaia Project fan, I would I would think it's a no-brainer because you probably want to see what it's all about. But it does add not too much complexity, but a little bit more. You basically have, in summary, from trying to remember, um, it's called the Lost Fleet. You have these spaceships on the board. And if you remember the QIC actions, which were on the main board, there were three QIC actions that you could do in the game. They've gone. Instead, each of these derelict spaceships has their own QIC actions, and you can only do the actions on a spaceship if you are within range of that spaceship. I think you've got to be within range of the spaceship, and then you've got to put a little marker on the spaceship. And once you've done that, you can then use the QIC actions of those spaceships. There's also two new uh, player boards in the game, two new colours, which means there's four factions because they're double-sided, and they do cool stuff as well. Uh, th there's all sorts of extra stuff as well in the game. But yes, Gaia Project Expansion, I mean, I enjoyed the game, but I'm not 100% comfortable with the base game yet. So for me, I just stuck to one of the base races, and I just fiddled around with the new stuff a little bit. But I did enjoy it. On the Sunday... I played Roads and Boats. Roads and Boats is a game which I've not played in many, many, many years. And we talked about playing it at Manacon about six months ago, and we did it. And it was an interesting game of Roads and Boats because three of us played it. I'd played before. Vari had not played before. Ray had played before, but it had, be, it had been years for me. Ray had played a practice game like a few weeks before, and that absolutely showed. She got off to a great start got her engine going, built the right buildings. Me and Varu were just fumbling around, not really knowing what we were doing, building the wrong things in the wrong place. But, and this won't make any sense unless you know the game, I managed to end the game early because what I did is I just massively produced lots and lots and lots of basic resources. I knew that I was so far behind the curve in terms of the production from gold to gold coins to certificates that if the game would have ended normally that Ray would have won because she would have been the only player to have probably managed to create some gold certificates which are worth a bazillion points at the end. So I thought I'm going to try and rush the end of the game and end it before she can do that and I managed to do that. I just produced so many resources. I also sent my transporters out and stole other people's resources, brought them back home and used a ton of resources to just build that monument. And the building of the monument is the end of game trigger. So I managed to trigger the end of the game, I think like one or two rounds before Ray was able to make her certificate. And I just managed to pit for the win because building the monument is worth points. And whilst I didn't have that many points in other places, I did get a lot for building the monument. So that was an interesting game. And spoke to somebody afterwards and they said, yeah, oh yeah, that is one of the strategies in the game. It isn't just about everybody going down the same route and everybody building you know, uh, a mine to get the gold then the mint to turn the gold into coins, and then the bank to turn the coins into a certificate. No, nope, not everybody needs to do that. There are other things that you can do in the game as well. It was good to play Roads and Boats. It's another game that I'd like to play a bit more of. There is a solo mode to the game. So I'd like to do a solo playthrough of that on the channel, probably be next July when I take the week off for my birthday. Also on the Sunday, we played Voidfall. Had an epic four-player game of Voidfall in the afternoon, Everybody had played before, so there wasn't any rules teach up front, and it was great to play the game again. Now, Voidfall is my favourite game of last year, and it is definitely in my top three games of all time, and I think it is a genius masterpiece of a game. However, in this game, I managed to squeak the win, and I sat in my corner, I did one attack the entire game to a neighbouring sector, which I took, and then that was it. And I just sat in that corner for the whole game. I was effectively playing my own game. There was no player interaction with anybody else. Graham was building up his massive Dreadnought fleet, but he was so far away. The scenario we chose had an aggression level of three, but we all started off in our own corners and there was no wormholes for us to move to each other. In previous scenarios that I've played, 
any scenario or a yeah which which has got a high aggressive value is because the players have these wormholes that they can actually get to each other quite quickly this one they couldn't so i had to build up a couple of defenses to just deter graham from coming anywhere near me but i'm not saying my opinion on the game has changed but i just feel that it's odd that you can win just by sitting in a corner and just doing the best you can now that's the game that is the design of the game but it turns out that three of us did that. Three of the four players kind of sat in the corner. I mean, I was playing the house which is perfectly suited to that, and that is how they are supposed to be played. Uh, and I and I did that. But it was just weird that in a four-player game, three of the players were kind of just staying at home and not really doing very much. But anyway, it's a great game. Still love playing it. And even just that efficiency puzzle of how am I going to do this, just so rewarding when it works out. And then in the evening, I played Unconscious Mind. Now, playing Unconscious Mind on the Sunday evening after, as I say, four or five days of very little sleep meant that I wasn't as patient with the other players as I should have been, so apologies for that in advance. But also, I'd gone into the game thinking that this was a medium plus game. Not quite medium to heavy, just mm, a bit heavier than medium. And the reason for that is that I have been working in the background on the official how to play videos for Unconscious Mind. And I've spent a lot of time over the last three or four weeks and I've written the script and I've done the filming and I've done the editing and these videos are coming along really well. But because I've been immersing myself in the game and I've written the script on how to play, I thought, ah, it's not too bad. This is all right. This is a heavy game. It's not a medium plus game. This is a heavy game. In fact, my how to play video for the base game is 43 minutes long. That should tell you that this isn't a medium game. Now, I'm not saying this as any way of a complaint or anything. I'm just saying that I, I gave myself a false impression of, of how complex this game was. And it isn't overly complex. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if you get this game and if you play this game, be prepared that it is a heavy game. As I say, a 43 minute video, a lot of which is set up, <laughs> about, about 12, 13 minutes I think is set up. We enjoyed the game. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy the game, I'm just commenting on my perception of how heavy I thought it was before actually playing it. And this was my practice game because I've covered it on the channel. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Unconscious Mind later on. But on the Monday morning, because Manacon runs from Friday lunchtime till Monday lunchtime, I played Shackleton Base. Now, Shackleton Base is a new game that's coming out. It's published by Sorry We Are French, Hachette UK, designed by Fabio Lopiano and Nestor Mangone. And a lot of people were talking about this game after UK Games Expo. And I contacted the publisher and said, look, I'm really interested in this game. It looks great. I'm a fan of both of the designers. And they said, yep, great, we'll, we'll send you a copy of it. Fantastic. Now, I am due to do a sponsored playthrough of this at some point in the future. But Shackleton Base may have been the best game that I played that weekend. It was very, very good. That was my first game of it. We were all learning together. We were pretty much learning from the rulebook. But I got a really good vibe from that game. The game comes with seven different companies and you choose whichever three companies you want to use. So there is a series of core rules for the game, but then whichever companies you use is going to change the rules of the game. We chose to play with the three suggested ones, which are recommended for your first game. And that's probably what I'm going to be covering on the video. But yeah, it was very good. And that's all I can say about it, really other than it was very good because that was the Monday morning. I was barely conscious, but it was a great game to finish the convention off. So that is Manacon. After Manacon, I didn't. I got home on the Monday, and then on the Tuesday, we did a live playthrough of Huang. This is a re-implementation of Yellow and Yangtze from Reiner Knizia, which in itself is a re-implementation of Tigris and Euphrates, which is one of the best games ever designed and when i started playing game when i started seriously playing board games in the late 90s tigris and euphrates everybody had it in the collection everybody was playing it and it was ranked i think the number one game on board game geek at the time now times have changed things have moved on and i eventually went off that game but yellow and yellow and yangtze re-implemented it 
with a number of tweaks and a number of changes. And this version, Wang, Huang, however you pronounce it, I'm not quite sure, is essentially a reprint of Yellow and Yangtze. So it's not really a re-implementation of it, it's the same game. Just the different name, different publisher, different artwork, different style and everything else. But it is essentially the same game as Yellow and Yangtze. I think they've done some extra little mini expansions or deluxe stuff for it, so it's not an exact copy of the game, but rules-wise it was the same. And my query for myself was, am I going to enjoy this game based on the fact that I really went off Tigris and Euphrates? Does this game still stand the test of time? Does it still hold up to modern games? And I have to say, it does. Now, bearing in mind, it, this was a sponsored playthrough video that I did, so Phalanx Games sponsored the playthrough. If you want to see it, please check it out on the channel. Just bear in mind, we did get a rule wrong, so check the description of the video. I got the rule wrong about building the pagodas. When you create a set of three tiles in a triangle, it immediately you have the option immediately to build a pagoda there. I For somehow, I don't know why, probably lack of sleep, I misread that rule in the rulebook and thought you had to spend an action to build the pagoda there. So apologies for that, but if you do watch the video, please bear that in mind. But I, I really enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it, and I want to play it again. Even though I really went off the original Tigris and Euphrates, I think the changes that this new version has brought in has helped alleviate some of the issues that I had with the original game. Is there still a place for a game of this style in the market? Absolutely, yes, it's different. And I remember Ben, who played in the game, said, I've never played anything like this, and Ben's played a lot of games. And it's great that we have a hobby so diverse in the number of different styles of games, and it's also great to see old school games still being good and still being playable. So that is Huang. I played it twice that day, once as a practice game, and then once which was the live playthrough. Next up, Mandalorian Adventures. So on the 24th, which is a Wednesday, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was a Wednesday. Or it might have been a Tuesday. No, it was a Wednesday. Mandalorian Adventures. So this is the new Star Wars themed game uh, designed by Corey Knitzka, who's done a lot of games, a lot of Star Wars games, formerly with Fantasy Flight games. But this one he's got together with a co-designer, Josh. And the Mandalorian Adventures is a... It, it's a game. It's a cooperative game. Yeah, I'll say cooperative game for now, which takes place over the, uh, the scope of season one of The Mandalorian. So if you haven't seen season one of Mandalorian, there may be some spoilers if you're worried about those sorts of things. But it is quite a smooth playing game. I played it in the afternoon as a learning game with Vicky. Then me and Rick played it in the evening. That is on the channel now. So if you want to see that, that is actually on the channel. And then we actually played the second mission as well, which I filmed. I haven't edited it yet, but I'm hoping to get that up next week. So if you're interested in seeing how mission one of the Mandalorian Adventures works, check out that. That is on my channel now. It went live on the Thursday morning at midnight because the, the embargo, we, we got told that there was an embargo on content and we weren't allowed to release any content until the Thursday. And I said, does that mean that I can actually film it on the Wednesday and release it at like midnight on the Thursday? And they said, yeah, that's absolutely fine. So that's what I did. So that video is out there now. Uh, what I think about the game, this was not a sponsored video at all, so I can give you my honest thoughts on the game. But I would just recommend you skip to the end of that video because me and Rick talk about our thoughts on the game in more detail there. And when I get around to uploading the video for Mission 2, again, if you just want to know our thoughts, just skip to the end of the video and we will talk about our thoughts on the game after Mission 2. First of all, I really liked it. And anything that's Star Wars related, I'm going to have a bias towards anyway, but the gameplay was really smooth. One thing that I really liked about it is a lot of the enemies, whilst they had hit points, they had like two, three, or four hit points, there was no real tracking of damage on the enemies. Now, there are rules for that, if you've got a four hit point enemy and you deal one damage to it, you put a little damage counter on it. But most of the time in the game, we were like, oh, okay, so that enemy's got three hit points. Right, I'm going to deal him three damage. And 90% of the time, we were dealing the exact damage that you needed to be able to remove the piece from the board. And that is because of the card play system allows you, oh, if I play a four attack card, that will deal four damage. 
and that I really liked that in the game. So it wasn't about constantly tracking all of these hit points on all of these enemies. So because of the card play system, it was just really simple. It was, I'm gonna play a card here to move to there, and then I'm gonna play a card here, which is attack four, four damage, it's removed from the board. The gameplay was smooth, the gameplay was streamlined, and it just flowed really nicely. The core card play mechanism was new to me. I've not seen anything like that before. That was really nice. You're basically playing cards in these columns, but when the columns reach a certain value, something bad happens. You want to try and avoid it, but you can't avoid it constantly because you are going to be having to move and attack. But yeah, we played the first two missions in the game. Now, there is one thing that I do want to say about the game in that the game looks to only contain four missions. But in the secret envelopes that you will open later on, you will get additional missions to play with the same map. So the game actually comes with four maps, each of which has a default mission for that map, but you can then unlock later missions which allow you to play different missions on the same map. And you can play a particular mission on any of the maps. My concerns about the game, and bear in mind this is only, we've only played it twice, is thankfully we played it two player. And the two scenarios that we played were both two player scenarios. You can play it true solo, or you can play it with more players than there are characters. Now, I haven't fully read the rules on this, but it sounds a little weird. Please tell me if I'm wrong on this, but if you're playing a scenario that has two characters in it, and you're three players, what you do is you actually shuffle the character cards from the two different characters together, and each player is drawing from a common deck, so you're, each player is actually playing both of the characters. I've not tried that yet. I don't know how that's going to be, but it seems a bit weird. So I, I'm not sure. As I say, I, I need to look into it more, but we had an absolute blast with the game and we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And yeah, it, it was good fun. And I, I want to play more. I need to explore this game and I want to see what these rules are about playing at an unusual, at a different player count to what's recommended for the scenario. If you know, please let me know in the comments. Tell me what they are to save me having to read the rule book. Moving on to the 26th of July, Don't Starve. So I've already mentioned this, that I did get a game of this in at Manicon, but on the 26th, I had friends come over and we did a learning game in the afternoon and then we did a live playthrough in the evening. That is on the channel now. And at the time that I'm recording this video, this is the only video that is out there for Don't Starve the Board Game. So Don't Starve the Board Game is a new game that is going to be coming to crowdfunding later this year. I don't know exactly when. It's published by Glass Cannon Unplugged, which are the people who brought us Frostpunk, Dying Light and Apex Legends. They are masters of taking a computer game IP and turning it into a board game. Now, please bear in mind, I have a very good professional working relationship with Glass Cannon Unplugged. That video was sponsored and I am going to be doing more sponsored coverage for that game in future. So please bear that in mind. However, this board game is one of the best, if not the best, conversion of a computer game to a board game format. I felt like I was playing the computer game whilst playing the board game because the way that they've designed a number of the mechanisms in the game is like, oh yeah, I can picture that. That's how that works. Little subtle things like if you are in one particular location and you choose to move from that location to another location then you can collect the default stuff that you can gather from that location as you're moving out and I'm like well that's exactly how the computer game works because if you decide oh I'm going to go over there while you're going over there you're always oh I'll pick up some bits of flint on the way and I was like that's great that's really good there's a number of other things in the game as well. We came across the tall bird in our practice game in the afternoon. We didn't come across this in the live playthrough in the evening, but we came across this, this a particular creature, and you'll know it if you've played the computer game. And we looked at the special ability of this, and it said, oh, so if it's night, it gets minus one damage. And I was like, oh yeah, because they're sleeping. They're sleeping. In the computer game, you go near them at night because you can walk near them and steal their stuff when they won't attack you because they're sleeping. I was like, this is brilliant. 
And on the flip side, you've got the bats. And the bats' special ability is if it's night, they deal one extra damage whenever they hit you. And I was like, well, that makes sense as well. So I felt very immersed in this game when I was playing it, that I was sort of like playing the computer game. And if you don't like the computer game, you, you might not like the board game. It is a crafting survival game. It's fully cooperative and it manages to capture that feeling really well. Check out the video if you are at all interested. It is a prototype version. The game is still being developed, but that video will give you a good idea of how it plays out. And if you're concerned that it's going to be another Frostpunk with a 70 page rulebook and an eight hour gameplay, it's not. It's a lot smoother. It's a lot more streamlined. There's a lot less rules. I don't know how big the final rule book is going to be, but we did that playthrough in, I don't know, what was it, two, two and a half hours, something like that. But yeah, check it out. While you're there, leave me a comment on the video. Give me the thumbs up, all of the usual stuff. Also, on the same day, and I didn't even take a photo of this, but we played Spectacular. Spectacular is a new game that is coming out at Essen this year. It is from Chili Fox Games, and Chili Fox Games and Aporta Games are two companies that are very closely linked because it's most of the same people in the, the companies. I always have eyes on everything they do because they've done so many really good games in the past and their rule books are always really good. So we played Spectacular. As I say, I didn't even take a photo of this, but this was a 30, 40 minute game about putting animals into a zoo. And I know we've all seen that theme before. It's not been overdone, but this game does it really well. And all I can say about the game is that we all really enjoyed it. It was very smooth, really interesting decisions. It flowed very well. It was speedy. And I will be covering it on the channel at some point later. Then on the 29th, which is the Monday of this week, Stephen came round, Pete came round, and we filmed two videos for Unconscious Mind. Now, the first of those was a practice game, which will never go public, but the actual tutorial and playthrough video for Unconscious Mind was filmed this week. That is not going to be made public until the publishers want me to, but it has been filmed, and that is all done. And as I mentioned earlier on, I've already talked about Unconscious Mind, so I won't tell you any more about it. Finally, the last game that I've played this month was Dice Masters D&D Battle for Faerun. Now, there was a copy of this game in a local library which had a small games collection. And the library was getting rid of those games because it wasn't able to store them anymore. And Stephen Cooper, who helps, well, he basically organises the regular games day at the library in Taunton, basically said to people, look, the library are closing down their games selection and does anybody want any of this stuff? And I went, Dice Masters. I remember Stuart Creswell telling me about Dice Masters about a year and a half ago and saying, you really need to try this game. This is really underrated. This is really good. And I was like, hmm, okay. So when this opportunity came up and I thought, oh, it's D&D themed, great. So Dice Masters is a game from WizKids that has been going for years. I don't know if it's actually still going or not, but it's had D&D, lots of sets. It's had Marvel, it's had DC, it's had everything. It's effectively, it's designed by Eric Lang and Mike Elliott, but it is effectively a re-implementation of the Quarriers system. Now, I got Quarriers when it came out and played it, and the base game Quarriers was not very good but it needed the advanced rules. And suddenly, if you play with the advanced rules for Quarriers, it was quite a fun game and it actually worked. What they've done with Dice Masters is they've taken that same system, turned it on its head. So in try, in, instead of just trying to get to 20 fame yourself, you're trying to deal 20 damage to your opponent, turned it into a conflict game, but it, it all works. It actually works really well. And a lot of the stuff that happens is actually quite thematic. It's a bag building game. So imagine Dominion, but instead of cards that you're drawing from a deck, you're drawing dice from a bag, but then you're rolling the dice and you might get random results. But you've got your own cards that you will take with you and only you can buy those cards. So not like Dominion in that way, but you also have a common offer. And we played the introductory game. Just me and Rick, we just played a two player introductory game and it was a lot of fun. And I, I want to play more of this game, even though I've only got the starter set, so I have very few options. That is all of the games that I've played with other people around a table. Yeah, 
I normally now talk about all of the games that I've played on Board Game Arena, and I'm going to do that very briefly, but I've already mentioned the Gaia Project game which I played. So let's talk about other games that I've played on Board Game Arena in the last month. Well, I've played five other games of Gaia Project. So in addition to that one that I played with Def and Ian, I've had five other games of Gaia Project on Board Game Arena in the last four weeks. Four of them, I think, were solo because the solo implementation of Gaia Project is on Board Game Arena, and I've played that a lot. So one of those was with other people, four of them were against myself. I've played a game of Earth, I've played a game of Lost Ruins of Arnak, I've played two games of Spellbook, which has made its way to Board Game Arena. Spellbook, a game which most people seem to dislike, and I actually quite like, that is that has come out. I've played five games of Draft and Write Records, all solo. And I've played seven games of Hadrian's Wall. I've actually now started to really play a lot of Hadrian's Wall on Board Game Arena. And I'm at the point now where I probably want to start playing it multiplayer rather than solo. The other games that I've played, I've played two games of Maracaibo on Board Game Arena. And I want to tell you a funny story. It's a bit embarrassing, but I'll tell you it anyway. So the Maracaibo tournament that is currently running on my Patreon supporters Slack channel, I'm in round three. I've done all right. I've managed to get I've managed to get through to like the quarterfinals or whatever. I'm I'm doing quite well at it, and we're playing a game which I know is going to be a tough game. I'm playing against really good opponents, and I am putting so much brain power and effort into every decision of this game, planning out my entire round and what I'm going to be able to do, and then I messed up right at the end of the game. I basically had 16 money. And my plan was that on my turn, or at the at the end of the game, I would complete one of the goals on my Admiral card, get the four money, and then I would that would give me 20 money, and then I could buy one of the prestige cards. I'd planned the whole thing. Unfortunately, the completing a goal on your Admiral card is something that you need to do on your turn. And I hadn't done it on my turn, and I wanted the opportunity to do it at that end of the game or the end of the round thing where you get to buy a card. And I was like, oh, I'm screwed. I've only got 16 money. I can't do that. I can't do that. Okay, well, I'll spend my 16 money instead, and I'll buy this. So it's basically cost me about 11 points. My mistake, now I know. So I did that, and I did that, and then the game didn't end. And I'm like... Why is the game not ended? Why are we all back at the start? Oh, wait a minute. That was the end of round three. We had a whole extra round to go. And I'd done all of these mental calculations on thinking that that was the end of the game. And it wasn't. So, yeah, that was funny. But anyway, I, I did manage to then complete that goal, get the 20 money later on in the round, and I did manage to get the prestige card that I wanted. It didn't win me the game. But anyway, that was... Uh, that was uh, Maracaibo on Board Game Arena. Fantastic implementation of the game. Other content that's been on the channel in the last few weeks. Mark from Ninja Geek Games did a preview video for Sirens the Deep Sea. I think the crowdfunding campaign for that has finished, but the pledge manager will probably be open for that at some point. So if you want to get a preview of that, that is on the channel now. That's Sirens the Deep Sea. I did an unboxing video for the Elder Scrolls from Chip Theory Games. I did that last night, so that's on the channel as well. And I did the live Q&A as I always do each month. Coming up, so I've got mission two of the Mandalorian Adventures, which I'm probably not going to get a chance to edit uh, before I go away for this weekend, but I will try and do that on Monday. So that will be coming up next week. That is mission two of the Mandalorian Adventures. Tuesday of next week, I am going to be doing a Patreon exclusive playthrough live of the Elder Scrolls. Now, the reason why this is a Patreon exclusive is, is because I'm going to be doing some sponsored content for the game later in the year. And on Tuesday, I am going to be learning how to play the game from the rulebook, which means that video is going to be very rough and is not really going to be suitable for the channel. I don't feel comfortable in, if I'm doing some sponsored coverage of a game, putting out the raw footage of me with my head in the rulebook getting all of the rules wrong. That is the process that I have to go through in preparation for the actual proper video. But it is something that I do like to offer to my Patreon supporters as a kind of behind the scenes view. So that will be happening on Tuesday. Very excited about that. Next Friday, 
I am going to be doing a live tutorial and playthrough of Minos from Board and Dice. Minos is their new big Essen release for this year. I'm actually playing it tonight. So I'm having a practice game tonight, and then I'm going to be having another practice game next Friday. And then next Friday, so that is what is the, the first, that's the second, the ninth. 9th of August will be a tutorial and playthrough for Minos coming to the channel. The Friday after, I am going to be doing a tutorial and playthrough of Keyside. This is the next key game designed by Richard Breeze, but this one is co-designed by Mr. David Turks himself. So that's coming to the channel. The week after that, I'm covering A Wayfarer's Tale, and then I'm going to be covering Barcelona with the expansion, also from Board and Dice. And then at the end of the month, I'm going to be covering Nucleum Court, also from Board and Dice. So August is Board and Dice month at Gaming Rules HQ. In the background, I am almost finished with the how to play videos for Unconscious Mind. I've probably got about 20 to 25 hours more work to do on them. I've put about 85 hours work in so far. They're all coming along nicely. I am doing a series of videos. There's going to be a how to play for the base game. There's going to be a second how to play, which covers the expansion and all of the modules. And then there's a third how to play, which is covering the solo game. In addition to those three videos, there is a tutorial and playthrough video, which is the one that I mentioned I filmed on Monday. And I'm going to be doing a solo playthrough as well. So there is going to be a series of five videos coming for In Unconscious Mind. I will be releasing them A, when they're done, and B, when the publisher allows me to release them. And the idea is that they will get released as backers start getting their copies, which I think is supposed to be this month. We will see. I say this month as in August 2024. I've never done this before, but I'm now going to tell you about what's happening in September because there is a lot already planned for September. Black Forest playthrough, Civilution playthrough, Gaia Project with the expansion, Spectacular, Galileo Galilei, SETI, Primal, and Shackleton Base. Now, I've said this a number of times on the channel, is I'm a 54-year-old guy, and I still get excited about games. Just reading those games off, bearing in mind... I've played Black Forest, I thought it was fantastic. I've played Civilution, I thought it was fantastic. I love Gaia Project, Spectacular was great. I've not played Galileo Galilei yet, but I've heard really good things. I've not played SETI yet, but I've heard really good things. Primal is amazing, Shackleton Base was fantastic. What a month, what a month September's going to be. But that's September, we've got the whole of August to get through first. I just wanted to share with you how excited about some of the stuff that I'm covering in September is. Let's do a Patreon update. So, as mentioned in the last two or three video logs, I don't quite know what's going on in the world, but, and this isn't a complaint, this is just an observation, things seem to have slowed down, and not just Patreon. So, if we talk about my YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, on average, every month, gets about 500 to 550 new subscribers. Of course, I might do some big video in a month, and I might get more, and then I might be a bit less the next month, but... On average, I get about 500 to 550 new subscribers on the YouTube channel every month. In the last three months, it's been about 300. I've no idea why, but it just seems to have gone, you know, it's been so steady at 500, 550 for years, and then it seems to have dropped. So, yeah, it's, I don't understand. It's one of those things. But the reason I'm mentioning it is the Patreon has kind of done the same. And I spoke about this last month and the last month before, is that every month I normally get 25 to 30 new people joining and I get about 25 to 30 people leaving. And that's how it's been every month for a very long time. But in the last few months, it's been 10 to 15 people joining and 10 to 15 people leaving. So, you know, we're staying stable with the numbers as they are. It's just there's less people coming in, less people going out which is unusual. And this month was no different. In fact, until last week, there were 13 new people that had joined the Patreon, and I think about 20 people that had left. But a number of things combined together, and in the last week, I've actually gained nine new Patreon supporters. So the total number of new supporters for July was 22. So a big thank you to all of you who have started supporting me in July. Your names are on screen now. This is a list of all of the people that have started supporting me in July. 
And if there isn't 22 people on this list, then I apologize because to produce this report, I have to run some kind of report from Patreon and it sometimes doesn't give me the right information. But apologies if you're missing from the list. And as always, a huge thank you to everybody who has stayed with me as an existing Patreon supporter because your support makes these videos possible. It makes a lot of the other videos possible and it makes things like me taking a week off work to do 14 live streams possible for my birthday. Other news. Just a couple of things that I wanted to mention. I have received recently some review copies of some escape room games. These are from a company called Key Enigma. I've heard really good things about them. They contacted me and they said, Paul, we'd like to send you an escape room game. Here's our website. Which of these do you want? So I've got these three. We're going to be playing one of these this weekend. So I will tell you more about this next month's video log because we're going to take one with us. Me and Vicky are going away this weekend. We're going to Dan's wedding and then it's our wedding anniversary actually on the Sunday. So Dan, who has been on the channel a number of times, he's getting married on the Saturday and then it's our wedding anniversary on the Sunday. So we're going away for the weekend. It'll be nice to have a bit of a weekend break from everything that's been going on here, but we're going to take one of these with us and we're going to do one of these while we're away. Also, Deep Print Games have sent me the Witness Games. So these are just out or they are just about to come out. And I really liked the sound of these, so they were very kind to send me these in advance. Now, The Witness is actually a game that came out quite a few years ago from another publisher, Istari Games. And I remember hearing about it at the time. It's a four-player game only, and you are whispering things to each other. And you're trying to piece together clues to work out what happened, but you're only allowed to know certain things. I'm not quite sure how it's going to work. It might be great. It might be a complete disaster. But... We haven't tried any of these yet, and I'm going to be trying some of these at some point in the next couple of weeks. Let me know. If you've played the original version of The Witness, let me know what you think about it, because this is effectively the same game. It's the same designer. It's got the same name. It's just a new publisher, and I assume new cases as well so that you can, you can play it if you'd played the old one. That's everything. We're all done. I am melting. I'm going to go for a nice glass of water. Thank you very much to everybody for watching. Thank you again for your support if you are one of my patron supporters. And if you're not one of my patron supporters, then even just giving this video a thumbs up, leaving me a comment and letting me know what you think about some of the games that I've talked about, that always helps as well. I will see you later in this month for many, many games. Take care and thanks for watching.